Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone today? It is Monday morning. Good morning. Good morning, Speedwalker, Shashi, Tina, Meredith, and Carol, and Diane. You probably are not even listening to a word I'm saying because you're too busy looking out my window over there, right? It's just beautiful. It's spectacular uh, what God can do, the beauty of God. Good morning. Good morning. It is Monday. We are in Bible study today, and I'm really excited to be doing this. I obviously am not at the barn today. Uh, we are visiting my, uh, hi, Lauren. We're visiting my son, Shay, in Arizona. And uh, we've been here. This is our fourth day. So we leave today. We fly home today, really pretty much after this, this Bible study. Uh, but yeah, I really wanted you all to be able to see what I see. <laughs> Isn't it just spectacular? Good morning. Good morning. So this is our hotel room. It's a, just a small little room here. Um, but the view is just gorgeous. The, the view we have is, you know, you can see the boulders here, but to the left of that, you know, you can see the, the outskirts of, of the mountains or what they call foothills. Um, and then, you know, the cactuses and just watching the sun rise every morning. It's just been, it's just, it's breathtaking here. So it is a little bit cold outside, but I opened up the doors because I wanted y'all to hear and see. I know there's some of you that actually live here in Arizona, but it, it's it's really been good for the soul to be in this place and in this space. And uh, I uh, I got to spend, you know, the last number of days with my son, Shay. And that has been, as beautiful as this is, <laughs> that spending time with my son has been, it's incomparable to this view. So that I'm thankful for and uh, glad to be here. So uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. I am on California time, Ariel. Uh, it's six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I now have a lot more empathy for you, for sure. How is everyone? Y'all ready to get into Bible study today? I know I certainly am. Good morning, good morning. If you're just joining me, welcome. Uh, I am in a, a, a hotel room here in Arizona. Uh, Hopefully, because the, the birds are really wanting to kind of overtake this Bible study right now. But I will share this little story. Yesterday, I was sitting on this back deck here, and there was this most beautiful, um, like, red. It, it may have been a cardinal, but I don't know what kind of birds they have out here. So it may not have been. It was prettier than a cardinal. It was somebody that's from Arizona. Maybe you can fill us in. But it was... Um, the spectacular like fuchsia red. And so as I'm sitting out there and I'm just praying and journaling and reading and and I see him down on the tree and I do one of these things like, okay, Lord, bring bring the bird to me. Like, I know you have the ability and power. Obviously you created birds to bring the birds to me. I'm like, just please at this one moment, I really need this. Like bring the bird to me like you did with Elijah, like you did, you know, with, uh, with Noah, like bring the bird to me. And, uh, of course, you know, not of course, but that didn't happen. And so it is what it is. So I was opening up the doors uh, this morning to get on here. And as I'm just standing and I'm overlooking this right here, that same bird, I don't know if it's the same one, but the same kind of bird literally comes right to me. It sits right there. <laughs> and it just took me a second. Like, am I literally like seeing this right now? Um, so who knows, maybe he'll fly in today. I, you never know what you're going to get, you know, when you open up doors in Arizona, <laughs> creatures and birds and lizards and all those fun things. My son and my uh, husband yesterday were golfing and they saw a rattlesnake. So, you know, we don't have, we don't have those out in Michigan. I mean, and it was big and it was, a, it was, it was something. So, uh, anyway, Yes, we are in Arizona, and I wanted you all to see what I'm what I'm looking at. But I'm really excited to get into um, Bible study today. I am flying home today at, this afternoon, and so I, I wanted to make sure that we are able to get on together this morning. And then we're gonna, my husband and I are gonna jump on a on a plane and head back to Detroit, which I hear is 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 beautiful. As well. It's probably warmer there than it is here right now. Real quick, while you all are. While you all are saying your good mornings to one another and uh, kissing each other's faces off like the Bible tells us to do, hug each other's necks really tight virtually and even tighter when you see each other in person, whether it's on this side of heaven or not. Um, I'd love for just to, to announce a couple things. There's going to be some weird noises. Can you all hear me okay or should I close the doors? Let me know because it feels loud right now. So let me know what you think. If it's too loud, it's too many noises, then um, I'll close it. So let me know, and then I'll, I'll share these announcements with you. Um, third, third Thursday registration is tonight. 
So that's tonight. Uh, if you are interested in coming out to the barn this Thursday, it's a it's a time that. Okay, thank you, Donna. It's fine. Tracy, you love the birds chirping. Okay, Julie. Okay, then we'll keep it. You just let me know. I can always get up and and, and close the doors. Uh, but third Thursday registration is tonight at six o'clock. So if you could just get your alarm set, I would really, really uh, appreciate that and encourage you to do this um, as far as registration. And Thursdays are really beautiful because it's a time that women gather. It's a time that we uh, we just come before the Lord. We have a Sabbath. We just let him fill us, you know, to overflow on those nights. And we get to be with other women, too, who are just hungry for him as well. And so it's a really beautiful time of healing, of um, you know, being passion filled again, uh, letting the Holy Spirit just sweep in through the barn's atmosphere and ignite um, and fuel the flames of your heart again. Um, there's just so much that happens. I, I don't even want to start to put words to it because it's, it's God. So that's going to be this Thursday. Registration is tonight at six o'clock. So mark your calendar for that. Men's group is tonight, eight o'clock. Wednesday, Angel Day, 11 o'clock. Come on out for that. Thursday, as I just said, third Thursday, find out the details of the time and all that beautiful stuff. I think it starts at seven. And of course, Sunday is SNL, which we had last night. Lauren Mosley spoke. Um, Jen and her amazing husband, Spence, they lead it. And so just amazing things uh, happening. So I'm going to jump right in because we've got we've got a really beautiful verse to, to talk about and to um, really dive deep into together. Does that sound good with everybody? Okay, so that is going to be Genesis 42, 25 through 28. I just feel like this is noisy. But if you guys are okay with it, we'll just keep moving. It's a good noise, I guess. It's a good noise to get to get used to. Okay, so if you could, I'm going to pray, but I really would love for you all just to open up your Bible, open up to Genesis 42. We are in verses 25 through 28. If you don't have a Bible, we want to send you one totally free, no strings attached. Uh, just get on there and we will send you a Bible. You can always pay for it as well, but we can. We also have people that are sending in donations specifically um, to get you a Bible. Uh, the word of God had changed my soul when I was in my worst, when I was just so utterly broken, literally on the floor weeping. Um, it was the word of God that he began to place within my heart and chisel truths in the areas of shame and chisel, chisel hope in the areas of false guilt and just removed little by little all the lies of the enemy because the the word is filled with God's truth, right? So, okay, so let's let's go ahead and pray, and then I want really want to get into. I've got this tiny little light. I hope you can see me, okay? But I really want to get into God's word today with y'all because uh, this one this one is really precious. They all are, but this one I just just love so much, and I've been praying over each one of you that the Lord just places His seeds in your heart in in just the unique and perfect and restorative way. So let's pray and see what he has for each of you, Lori and Kendra and Rachel and Heather and Donna. So, Father, I thank you for you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is in here. And in the name of Jesus, any spirit that is not of you, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that spirit out. We, pr we pray for peace. We pray for purity. We pray for humility. We pray for your Holy Spirit to reign in the name of Jesus, not just in this place, but in every person that is represented here, Father God, in the throne room of our hearts and our lives. Father, thank you that you are a God that steps in and you clean house. And sometimes cleaning house can feel really messy and can feel really uncertain and can feel a, a bit discombobulated. But Father, as we're learning today, as you have shown me and showing through us, through, showing us all through the word of God, that sometimes the discomb discombobulation, if that's the word, <laughs> the disassociation, Father God, from reality is not a bad thing. You take us away. And sometimes the disorientation is a time for you to reorient us. And so, Father, I just give this over to you. I pray that you just allow every one of us to release what needs to be released today, Father, to all take a deep breath and inhale you as we just speak your word out. And Father, we just thank you for your word of God that is uh, active and alive and powerful and breathing. And Father, I just am desperate for more of you today. So Father, I thank you for this precious community. I thank you for the opportunity and the honor and the privilege of my life to pray over each one of them. Father, I thank you that we are all on this journey together. There is no hierarchy. 
We thank you, Father God, for being the teacher, for being the counselor, for being the healer, for being the restorer, for being the builder, builder, for being the architect. Father, it is you. It is always about you. We become less so that you become great. And so, Father, we thank you for the gift of humility. We thank you, Father God, that in the humiliation, it is always a gift. And so, Father, I pray that these words on, on, on your beautiful, powerful, alive, active word, Father, would come alive today, would penetrate our hearts. My own feeble, messing up words right now, they mean nothing because it's all about your powerful spirit that gets right into the confinement of our heart and heals us from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus. That is not about us, but it is all about you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's get right into Genesis 42, 25 through 28. I, if you're just joining me, welcome. I'm coming to you from Arizona. I'm here uh, visiting my son. Today is the fourth day, and then we are getting on a plane and, and going back home. It is early here, so um, the sun is coming, and I love it. Uh, it's about 6.11, but I'm so thankful to be here. So let's just jump into it. I'm going to start to read Genesis 25 or 42, 25 through 28, I would love for you to join me, read along with me, maybe underline some things that the Lord is really highlighting for you. And then I say, we just jump right in and see what he has. This is what the, I believe it's the NLT that I got this from. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to put each man's silver back in the sack and to give them provisions for their journey. Okay, just put a pin on that for one moment. So basically, remember last week, this is Joseph, that he's sending his brothers back, except for Simeon or Simon, however you want to say that. It's probably Simeon. And he's leaving him in prison, but he's sending his brothers back home to get his younger brother, Benjamin. But he's he's allowing them to have their food that they paid for. And um, and so he's he's put their, he put a silver coin back that, in their sack that they used to buy this grain with, but they don't know this, okay? And then he also paid for their provisions on their journey. It goes on to say, after this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and they left. At this place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened up their sack to get feed for his donkey and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. Okay, so just picture that he's opening up, he's, they bought this food and there's that silver coin that they used to buy the food sitting on top of the sack. They're already scared of Pharaoh. They're already scared of this man that is second in command that they do not know is their brother Joseph. They're already terrified because they have to go back and get their youngest brother, Je Benjamin, that they know their dad is saying, don't get him. And so uh, we go on to read in 28, my silver has been returned, he said to his brothers, here it is in my sack. So obviously we recognize that Joseph paid, probably most likely paid for all their food. Their hearts sank and they turned to each other, trembling with fear. And they said this, what is it that God has done to us? What is this that God has done to us? This is interesting because this is the very first time, you guys, that they actually use the word God. They see God as harsh and they see him as mean as they see him as condemning and they see him very fearful. They see God as they are. They have this lens of God, of fear, of condemning, of harsh, of mean, because we only see people as we are. In fact, it's Titus 1.15, it says, everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving. This is the thing. This is when we can check our heart. When all of a sudden we're believing things about people that they, they did something to us or they offended us or they mistreated us and, and they did it purposefully and we don't have the best intention of that person's heart, oftentimes it's a result of what's going on in our own hearts, in our own lives. Amen. The pure... Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure. And I'm and I can relate to that. I know that when I'm when I'm really operating out of pureness, not per perfection. Pureness and perfection are two different things. But I'm operating out of the pureness of God. I do see people and things and situations and offenses and hurts uh in a pure filter. But when I'm dealing with my own corrupt heart and I'm dealing with some undealt dealt with sin and I'm dealing with some guilt that they're experiencing right now, everything is corrupt. Everything is impure. They couldn't see this as a gift of grace. Because this is the thing. They couldn't see that this coin on top of their sack was a gift of grace because a spirit of guilt doesn't let you have a lens of grace. 
they still have the spirit of guilt. They have not come before their father. They don't know that their father is a good God. They don't know that there's a throne of grace. They don't know that they can just melt and become prostrate on the ground in every wrongful sin that they have done. And they have done it. And it is, it is, they have been wayward and it has been gross and it has been dark and it has been evil. But God says, if you come before my throne, every single bit of that is washed away. My blood has covered it, but they haven't done that. They have kept themselves from the light because they can't bear the light thinking that it would actually kill them, but it's actually going to heal them. And because of that, they have a spirit of guilt, guilt that does not let them have a lens of grace. Anybody been there before? And this is why the enemy wants you to stay in your guilt, because he knows if he can keep you cloaked in guilt and you actually think you're a better Christian because you're still wearing that guilt, then if he can keep you from the, 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 um, the throne of grace, he'll keep you in guilt. And the guilt keeps you from receiving that undeserved, unmerited, crazy, ridiculous healing from the inside out grace. The enemy is so crafty. And he'll actually make us believe that carrying the guilt of our past, carrying the guilt of your wrongful decisions, carrying the guilt of the should have's and the would have's and the could have's of life is actually a good thing. It's a good discipline to carry. And it's, it couldn't be anything further from the truth. There is a form of God guilt, but we then take that. We have a conviction. We see it. And then we, 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 we tie our shoelaces and we run as fast as we can with confidence, with boldness into the throne room of grace and receive an undeserved pouring, a sprinkling of his blood that makes us as white as snow, places that warm white robe upon your back and releases you from the labels and the names of the pits and the depths of hell that were placed on you through possibly a person, but it's not the person. We are never in a battle of flesh and blood. It is always about this, this war underneath the principalities of the, of the world of darkness that we can't see. And that's what I'm going to be praying for, you know, I, uh, I had a, I mean, I have just had such a, an awesome four days with my son and, um, my son Shay is, he's going to be a guest on my, on this study soon, but, um, I, uh, I just had such a great time with him this week and he's had this like renewal of his spirit. Have you ever had that? Sorry, my hair, this, this, uh, <laughs> this Arizona hair is interesting, but he, uh, he had this experience with God um, about a month ago that has left him a, a completely different person. And I'm going to let him share. It's not my story to tell. But I've just been leaning in and learning from him in the last four days. And he's been reminding me, Mom, we, we oftentimes see the world with what we see with our human eyes. He said it is not about seeing the world with our human eyes. In fact, we are more spirit than we are flesh. In fact, it was the spirit that made the flesh. And so biblically, we see just just please take this in because this is so much truth. What we can't see right now in this room, there is spirits, there is demonic spirits that are at war with the Holy Spirit. And the, and the enemy sends out his army of demons because he is not omnipresent. He does not know exactly what's going on. We only need one Holy Spirit. There is one God. There is one Jesus Christ. Right. There is one. That's all that's needed. But we've got these army of, of the enemy spirits that are constantly trying to lie to you, constantly trying to take you away from the truth of God's grace. And there's this constant war that's being waged and we don't necessarily always see it with our eyes. And that's why taking time like this in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon to just pause and say, Lord God, open my eyes to see what I cannot see with my flesh, but let me see what it is in the spiritual realm of that which you're doing for me. And in the story of Elisha, he prayed that for a servant because they were being surrounded. Like, are you being surrounded right now? That song about the battle, like, I, like, I'm surrounded by you. And so he prayed, Lord, open his eyes of his heart to really see what's happening. And he opens up his eyes of his heart and he recognizes that God's army outnumbers the enemy's army. And so that's going to be my prayer for you as you walk through this hurdle, as you walk through this mountain, as you walk through this trial, as you walk through this tribulation, as you walk through this violation. I pray in the name of Jesus that you refuse to just see what you can see with your human eyes because the enemy, that's how he works. He puts things in your path and he puts things in your in your visible um, eyesight to trip you up, to mess you up, to 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 fear you up. But when we take the time to pause and ask the Lord, like, open up the eyes of my heart to be able to see that you actually outnumber the enemy's army. 
But see, as brothers, they didn't have that opportunity to do that because they also were operating out of a spirit of guilt. And today we've got to remove that spirit of false counterfeit demonic guilt so that we can walk in the grace that we have not deserved and we have not earned. And the enemy will tell you for the rest of your life that you haven't deserved it and you shouldn't receive it. And he's absolutely right. But God, that is the whole point of him dying on the cross. But God. And so my, the point of this entire message is the brothers were given a curveball, right? It was a sharp turn season. Like this, they open up their, their sack. They were not ex expecting there to be a silver coin on top of their sack. And they didn't see it as a blessing. They saw it as a curse. And they became very fearful of this God. What has God done to us now? They were given a curveball. You ever been there? You had expectations that your life was going one way and then bam, a curveball. They had expectations that we're going to go home. We're going to get Benjamin. We're going to say this to dad. We've got the, got the grain. And all of a sudden they just are go, go into bed one night and they open it up and it's bam, a curveball. What? What is this? I didn't see this coming. And so this weekend, there's a there's a man in this area named Preston. He has a church called the Pillar Church. And man, I just love this guy. And I was listening to his message and it was about a curveball. And so I'll, some of the content that I'm going to be sharing with you is from the overflow of what he shared with me and what the Holy Spirit placed in my heart. But this curveball is defined as anything in your life, as we see with the brothers, a curveball is a life um, hard transition, like not just a life transition, but a difficult transition that you did not see coming. Anyone having a curveball? And unbeknownst to you, we end up worshiping how we want it to go. We want our life to go the way we want it to go. We have expectations. It's supposed to look like this. I'm supposed to go here. This is what it's supposed to look like. If I do A, B, it's going to equal C. You know, like we have these expectations that we don't even know. And we, we don't even realize that we're worshiping how we want it to go. And we find out all too soon that expectations become an idol that we've been worshiping, that we didn't even know that we were worshiping until there's a curveball. I heard this quote before, I've learned to hold all things loosely so that God never has to pry them out of my hands. I'm not there yet, but I've learned to hold all things loosely so that God never has to pry things out of my hands. And this is the thing when I know the love of God, when I know the love that has ambushed me and, and set me free because I deserved it the least, I am willing to trade in my expectation for his intention, his intention. The curveball is his intention. If you've gotten a curveball just recently, God had to allow it to pass through his hand to give you a curveball. God sent these boys a curveball. What looked like a disgrace was actually God's grace. And speaking on expectations, it's been said that expectations are just premeditated disappointments, correct? But but God calls us to have this shameless, persistent audacity to have a divine expectancy as we lean into the mysteries of God. Yes, expectations, they're premeditated disappointments, 100%. Yet God tells us to have this heightened expectancy as we lean into the mysteries of God. This week, uh, I was sharing this with some of my girlfriends, but this weekend, I'm in 2 Kings. 2 Kings is just fascinating to me right now. And 2 Kings, this one particular story, Elijah, who was one of the greatest prophets ever, I mean, miracle after miracle that God worked through this very normal individual, normal human being. And he's he's dying. And the king of Israel comes to him because I think he's fearful that Elijah's dying because Elijah would hear from God and then go to the king and say, hey, by the way, the uh, the enemy's coming your way. So stay away from that north place or stay away from this east area. And so the king really relied on God speaking through Elijah. And so Elijah's dying and the king goes and finds him and he's crying. He's like, I don't want you to die. And Elijah knows that he's coming to his final minutes, possibly. And so he says to the king, listen, my last words to you are going to be this. Take that huge quiver full of arrows right now and shoot one to the east. And we know that when he shoots to the east, the east means like the, the temple is on the east. We know that God's, in fact, it says that the garden at the very beginning of Genesis with is in the east. It just means God's in the east. There's something about east 
And so he shoots one to the east, just reminding this, this is this, this king in Israel. It is God that you're going to serve even after I'm gone. It is God that you go find even after I'm gone. It is God that you have intimate walk with even after I'm gone. You don't need me. You've got the Holy Spirit that can speak to you. Shoot the arrow to the east. But then he does something so interesting because he said, okay, now take some more arrows. And he doesn't tell him how many. And he goes, now shoot those to the ground. And so the king of Israel shoots three arrows to the ground. And then he's done. And uh, Elisha literally says in 2 Kings, he goes, that's all? <laughs> he said, that's all you got? You only shot three arrows to the ground? And then he literally goes on and goes, you could have shot five. You could have shot six, but you only chose three. And basically he said, he said, now you, you will only be able to defeat your enemy three times. And what I took from this is like, sometimes we put an expectation on God and we limit him. God's like only three prayers. Like you only invited three friends into this prayer circle. Like, like only three, like let's, let's, let's heighten that a bit. Let's have an expectancy. Let's have an audacity. Let's have, let, let's have this like, uh, like crazy, ridiculous amount of hope. For God to do the impossible, but like in our own human, it's like, let's just lower those expectations, you know, because I just don't want to be getting my hopes up if God doesn't really come through. But man, we see throughout the word of God, God is like, no, I don't want you living and operating out of expect expectations because that limits me, that put me in a box. But you can expect me to do with expectance, heightency above and beyond what you can even imagine. Don't stop at just three arrows into the ground. Take all that quiver and keep going into the ground and keep putting into the ground. And I love that there's arrows in the ground because God calls us arrows. And he's like, don't you dare put those arrows anywhere else but the ground because you're going to pray and you're going to get on the ground. You're going to pray more than three times on the ground. You're going to pray over and over and over and over. And you're going to have persistency and you're not going to give up and you're not going to believe the lie that God can't hear you. You're going to get those knees to the ground till those knees are worn out because the God of the universe is collecting your tears and he is moving and, and you're behalf. Do not stop at three arrows, he tells him. Getting back to curveballs. Uh, but pill, this pillar church was saying, I just love about the curveballs. And I, I was praying over you about these curveballs because we've all had curveballs and we don't want the curveballs. We see the curveballs as a curse and not as a blessing. We see the coin in our sack as a disorientation, but really it's an opportunity for God to reorient you. I was thinking about my own life, just a, just an example. If you're like, okay, well, maybe what's a curveball? Like, what what could a curveball in my life possibly be? For me, just this pales in comparison to some of your curveballs. But for me, a curveball was like it just came out of like left field, right? Um, diagnosed with scoliosis in the prime of my tennis season in high school, and it, I had to, you know, at that point, like I went to a doctor appointment. Everything was fine. I'm in varsity tennis. It's I've got friends and things are going well, and like it just one doctor appointment. All of a sudden, I'm like what? Wait, what are you talking about? In the 1990s, you had to wear these bulky braces that were humiliating and embarrassing. In 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 the time frame of already being a teenager, right? Like a curveball, like. Had I just not gone to that doctor appointment, maybe this just would have never happened, right? And then at age 40, going to a doctor appointment for just an updated x-ray, one appointment changed everything. One, one curveball, I was told that I had to have a spinal fusion surgery from the top of my neck to the bottom of my tailbone and having to put 24 brackets in every every area of my spine and, and, and two 18-inch, you know, rods, steel rods. And like, wait, what? Like, What's happening here? I just came to a doctor appointment. You know, another curveball in my life was, you know, finding porn on my husband's, you know, computer for the umpteenth time. And just at this point, recognizing, like, I think this marriage is over. And also, let me just put a pin in that for a moment. I also had my own porn going on. It may have been different kind of porn, but I had my own idolatry. I had my own brokenness. I had my own issues. I had my own sins. I had my own strongholds. And they were just as severe, maybe even more than my husband's. But at this point, I was too broken to recognize mine. But when I found his, I'm like, this curveball, this marriage is over. And maybe for you, maybe your curveball is a Dear John letter. Curveball. Maybe... You're laid off at work, curveball. Yesterday you had a job, today it's gone. Maybe a sudden death of a loved one, curveball. Maybe a betrayal, curveball. 
maybe a diagnosis, curveball. Maybe it's an eviction, curveball. Yesterday, this was my home. This was my safe haven. Haven. Today I get here and there's a letter on my door, curveball. Maybe it's a financial crash. Stocks were way up yesterday within 24 hours, curveball. Maybe it was a lawsuit, curveball. Maybe it was a physical debilitation, curveball. A curveball, you guys, they're sudden and they're caught by surprise. Satan uses curveball seasons to threaten you with disappointment, fear, confusion, disorientation, discombobulation, which I was say, trying to say in my prayer. Obviously, God did not want me to get that word out. Discombobulation. And that is a really important word. But this is the thing I find in my curveballs. Like I am, I am cloaked. I mean, that ball like threatens to hit me with a, this, 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 this hard ball of hopelessness. And this is the thing I was just reading in my word this morning Hebrew, in Hebrews. Hebrews 6, 19 through 20, it says this, but this hope, this hope, because remember curveballs, they want to eradicate hope from your life. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for my soul. This hope leads me through the curtain into God's sanctuary. It goes on to say that this very sanctuary is where Jesus lives and dwells. This hope leads me to where Jesus is. Do you see now why the enemy puts these curveballs in your life? Because he wants to eradicate hope from your life because the hope becomes a tr strong and trustworthy anchor for your soul. But it also leads you into the curtain, into God's sanctuary, that very curtain that when Jesus died, it split from top to bottom so that you could come in and you could have intimacy. You don't need someone to tell you, like an Elijah, to tell you what God says. Like you get to come boldly into the throne of grace and receive every single thing that you do not deserve. That's what hope does. Hope is so important. And it's also that anchor because when you go through the curveball season, when you go through that trial, when you go through that disappointment, when you go through that loss, it is hope that's going to anchor you. It is hope that's going to keep you there. It is hope that's going to keep you from being discombobulated and disoriented. We need hope, not the world hope, but the godly hope that only comes from your maker, from the very hands that made you. Hope. And the enemy knows this more than we know this. So he's going to do everything he can to eradicate hope from your life. And so if we can see curveballs as a curse and not a blessing, the brothers see this curve, this curveball of a, of a coin on their sack as a curse and not a blessing as, as of grace, then they miss the beauty of their father. They miss the kindness of their father and they see him as harsh and not kind. We are drawn to repentance by the kindness of God. Curveball seasons can cause you to lose your direction and your stability. Amen? You ever been there? They cause you to lose your direction and your stability. I know when I go through curveball seasons, I, I hear myself saying out loud to people, I don't feel like I'm on solid ground anymore. Everything feels unstable right now. Everything feels uncertain right now. Yesterday, it was solid. Curveball, it feels loose and unstable. Uh, I was driving last week. My daughter and I were going to an appointment in Grand Rapids um, last Monday. And she was driving my car. And she's not a fast driver. But there's these ramps to get onto the uh, freeway, <laughs> a couple of them in Grand Rapids. And I'm sure it's because I was a passenger and I'm not a fun person to drive with. In fact, it's like a running joke in my family that like um, when I'm in the car with anybody, with my kids, with my husband or the whole family, like I guess I say things a lot like uh, <laughs> like slow down or there's a there's a break right there or you better stop, you know. And so they all just kind of make fun of me. But she's driving through this like this ramp. And literally I felt like the car was going to flip over, but she's, you know, she's, she's just driving to me as the passenger. It felt like this car was going to flip over. And, you know, like it, and, and I had to, I was holding on for dear life as we're going over this, 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 the ramp to get onto this expressway. And, and literally everything in my car went flying, like my pens and my Bible and, you know, cause we're all like holding on for dear life. And it's like, 
is that not how a curveball season feels like? Like I was just on the freeway, like everything was straight and the path was good and I'm flying and I'm saying hi to other people and all of a sudden, bam, a curveball happens and I'm holding on for your dear life and I feel like this whole thing is gonna be disoriented and I'm gonna be discombobulated, I'm gonna be flipped over. You been there? Curveball moment is disoriented and discombobulating. We had a cottage back in the day, my parents did, um, and we used to take our family there every, every, almost every weekend in the summer. And we used to have this dog named Uggy, this older bulldog, before we got our two new bulldogs. And this dog loved to get into the water. You know, it could swim a little bit, but not much. And, uh, and so it'd get in the water. Well, for some reason, our dog had gotten in the water like always did, and it was, it was kind of just swimming. And then all of a sudden, he kind of lost where he, where she was she she just had no idea i was watching her from the shore she got so discombobulated that she started to go down instead of up because she didn't understand where she was and i remember like that just really stuck with me how easy it is to get discombobulated when we know a certain path and all of a sudden a curveball happens remember jfk the plane in 1999 it says here that kennedy remember he was driving a plane with his new bride says that Kennedy reportedly became disoriented while flying through thick fog over the coast of Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. The plane spiraled downward and crashed into the Atlantic Ocean. The plane plummeted into the ocean within 30 seconds, all because he didn't know what was up and what was down. He had this moment of discom, dis, I can't say that word, discombobulated. And this is the whole point of a curveball season is for the enemy to disorient you. This is a season for you, for me, for our lives, when everything goes from predictable to unpredictable. It can be in one call. It can be in one text. It can be in one email. It can be in one conversation. It can be in one meeting. It can be one appointment. It can be one day. Anytime I'm feeling disoriented, it's a ripe time for God to reorient me. This coin in the brother's sack was a curveball, and this left them very fearful and disoriented. This is the thing the brothers weren't able to see this curveball is actually a blessing, like we've been talking about, to save their life. With, with Joseph putting that coin in their, in their bag, it was to save their life, not to break their life. This may look like an injury right now, this curveball in your life, but it's God's victory. This curveball may look like it's a disgrace, but it's really God's grace. This curveball right now, it might feel like straight up humiliation, but anything, as Lisa Turkis has said in the past, anything that infuses me with humility is good. The workings of humility within are a gift. The curveballs look like it's coming right to the head, but it doesn't hit you and break you. It passes you by to make you. Okay, let's jump into God's word a little bit here. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says this, for God is not a God of confusion, or in some translations say, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Please repeat that, type that out if you can. God is not a God of disorder. God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of peace. So if you are feeling disordered, if you are feeling confused, if you are feeling chaos, God wants to bring calm into your chaos. He wants to bring hope into your peace. He is not a God of confusion. He is not a God of peace. So if this curveball has caused confusion, it is the enemy using it to, to break you and not to make you. Then disorder makes you feel literally out of order. Disorder in your life through a curveball, the enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to get you out of order, right? So we know like order, when we say like, stay in order, we other, in other words, we're saying like, keep God on the throne of your heart. Like keep going to the throne room, keep going to your father, keep going to your maker, keep opening up his word and let it just sweep over you. Let it just fall into you. Let it get into your innermost being, right? But when, when we have disorder, 
we, we are fear-based and we become out of order and we put people first or we put attorneys first or we put counselors first or we put that best friend first and we put fear first, whatever it is. And we don't even realize we're doing it. And soon we become out of order because disorder places you out of order, which then gives you, listen to this, like a sign that says I'm out of order. Some of you have heard me share this story, but I have to share it again. One time, I, every Friday, I used to take my little boy, Jesse, when he was in kindergarten to 12 Oaks Mall. We used to go get a bubble gum at the, at the, uh, the animal place where they sell those sweet little puppies and kittens that I just, oh, it breaks my heart. Every time I go there, I want every single one of them. I'm not sure why I do that to myself. But they have a big gumbo, bubble gum machine there, and he would take his quarter every Friday. It, he Literally, when I say like that's what got him up on Monday is to get the bubble gum on Friday, I'm not even messing around. And so it's Friday. He's got his bubble gum. He's so excited. We get there, and there's this big white piece of paper on the bubble gum machine, and it says three words, out of order. And Jesse was so confused because he sees the bubble gum in the bubble gum machine. It's right there. He's got the quarter. Why is it that I can't put my quarter in the machine and it gives me what it was made to do and to give me? And you guys, we're the same. We got the bubble gum. We look like we're, we're living and operating as we're supposed to be. But we literally, when we have disorder that gives us that now we're living out of order, it places this sign over us that says, I'm out of order. I cannot do what I was made to do. That bubble gum machine was made to give kids bubble gum and put a smile on their face and also give us parents a very high bill at the dentist's office. But it wasn't, it wasn't able to do what it was actually manufactured and made to do because it was out of order. I lived most of my adult life with an out of order sign on me. I knew it. I felt it. And I was not doing what God had commissioned and called and predestined me to do while was, I was in my mother's womb. He made you, Debbie. He made you, Tina. He made you, Susan. For a cause and a purpose far greater than you can even imagine. But first and foremost, he made you to be a receptive receiver of his love. When we're not living and operating out of the undeserved love of God to ambush and wreck us forever, we're out of order. It's not about the doing. The doing part is the, is the, is the, is the blessing that puts a smile on a kid's face like a bubblegum machine. The purpose of your life, if you ever wonder what's the purpose of your life, is to receive the love of God. You are made to receive the love of God. Just as much as I've got to plug in my phone every night, you got to plug yourself into the love of God. And the enemies, the moment your feet hit those beautiful fiber, you know, pieces of your carpet floor bedroom, the enemy is going to tell you, you don't deserve that love. God doesn't love you. You've done too much thought, too much said too much. And it's all a lie from the depths of the darkest part of hell itself. Your purpose is to live loved, period. A curveball season, and I'm wondering how many of you are in a curveball season, coming out of a curveball season, or just getting ready to go into a curveball season. And that's the thing. We don't even know when we're about to go into a curveball season, right? But the kindness of God oftentimes will start to spark your spirit, knowing that you're entering into a curveball season. But this is the thing. Curveball seasons allow God to reorder things. And I was praying about this and there's two things that he does during a curveball season. Okay. There's a couple, there's many things he does, but there's a couple things here and he shakes and he prunes and it's for your good. So there's many verses that talk about God shaking things so that the unshakable things will remain. Uh, I think one of them is in Hebrews where it says that I'm going to shake things up so that the unshakable things remain. And that's why curveball seasons are a blessing and not a curse because they shake things up. They shake things out that shouldn't be there. They shake things. There may be some relationships. They shape some. They shake out lies. They shake out um, pollution from the enemy. They they shake out uh, pride. They shake out strongholds. They shake out um 
uh, defects of character. Like God is shaking right now and the shaking never feels good. Amen. I don't like when things, when God has to shake things in my life, I I'm pretty good just being on cruise control on the freeway. I don't want you shaking things, but it's, it's, or he needs to shake the things to purify your soul. And so God's going to always, if you are a Christian, if you have put, you know, God as, as your Lord and Savior and you're saying, not my will, your will, you are going to have seasons of, of shaking. And oftentimes it's through the curveball moments, through the curveball seasons, through the curveball disorientation, that there is a shaking that feels like everything is being shaken away. But let me tell you, the unshakable things remain. And let me tell you the very one that will never be shaken from you, and that's Jesus Christ. Everything else might be taken away. All your friends, all your family, all your reputation. And I know that's painful. I know that's painful. And I don't want to ever sugarcoat that and say that it's not because it is. It's extraordinarily painful. But what I want you to recognize and I want you to know that the anchor that is deeply woven in the core of your being, which is Jesus Christ himself, is unshakable. And there is always, always a root still there that will develop new fruit. And then there's this time of pruning. Again, for my good, and it says in John 15 too, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. But he also prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Anybody in a shaking season? Anybody in a pruning season? He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. But this is the thing. Yes, Katie Guzak, where I am weak, you are strong. Amen. If we keep mistaking God's pruning as the enemy's bruising, we'll stay stuck. And honestly, I have found myself mistaking God's pruning for the enemy's bruising. And this is the thing. Sometimes maybe it is the enemy's bruising. But I forget that God's going to use it as his pruning. Anything that the enemy puts your way, God uses if you allow it for your good and his glory every single time. And I pray that you put that on repeat because I need it. For instance, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel, they had to go through the fire. This was their silver coin. What about Daniel in the lion's den? The lion's den was their silver coin. What about the Israelite in the wilderness for 40 years? The wilderness was their silver coin. What about Joseph that was thrown in a pit? Man, this was a curveball. This was his silver coin. What about Elijah when Jezebel threatens to kill him and take him out? Man, this was a curveball. One moment, God from heaven is throwing down fire and showing how awesome he is. The next minute, I'm being threatened to be killed by this woman. It's a curveball. It's my silver coin, he said. What about Job? Children killed? Life taken, reputation smeared, friends misunderstanding the intentions of his heart, physical ailments beyond comprehension, curveball, silver coin. Paul, prison, beaten, whipped, mocked, slandered, curveball after curveball after curveball after curveball. It was his silver coin. What about Jonah? Thrown into the depths of the ocean. A whale comes and swallows him up. Curveball. Silver coin. And in all these instances, and that's just, just a sampling of hundreds in the, in the word of God, all of these circumstances, all of these situations, it looked like this was going from bad to worse. Curveballs look like they're going from bad to worse. But just possibly... The very going from bad to worse moment might actually be God's rescue mission on your life. What is it right now in your life that's your curveball? I want you just to see what that is. Put it out there for you to see it. And then ask God, could this thing actually be your rescue mission on my life? You shaking things up, you pruning so that more fruit can be, can be born and produced within me. 
It doesn't feel good to be shaken. It doesn't feel good to be pruned. I do not like pruning my trees. I do not like pruning my flowers. I don't like, I actually am verbally out loud saying to these things, I am so sorry. <laughs> do you guys do that? I'm like, I'm so sorry. This is for your good. I promise you're going to be so much more beautiful. You're going to be so much more glorious. I know this is painful. I literally say this out loud. <laughs> my neighbors were like, yeah, she's talking to those plants again. It's, it hurts. It's painful. But we know what the end result and what it produces. Some of these curveballs, like we talked about, they were sent from Satan himself. They were. You have, is that, do, there's a bird, right? That's the bird, you guys. Did you, he just flew out. That's, all right, pause. This is worth a pause. Do you remember me telling you the story when I got on this morning that I prayed that the God, that the Lord would bring that bird to me yesterday? He didn't bring the bird to me, but he brought him to me this morning on the deck. He literally just flew in and landed on that chair right now inside the hotel room. And then flew back out. Oh my word. The same bird from yesterday, the bright red. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm just a little undone. I'm having a bad one. The bird just flew in here, you guys. The bird I literally prayed yesterday that God would bring to me. Like Elijah. I just, I, I just. It's awesome. Okay. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. My, my spirit is like doing the happy dance inside. Just how awesome he is. So God, okay. So this is what we're talking about, how these curveballs can be, but they can be brought in from Satan himself. I'm not going to say that they're not, but God, right? He uses it for good. This is why we talk about the judo Jesus a lot. My husband was um, an amazing, um, uh, like, I don't know what you call it, just amazing at judo. He competed in like junior Olympics and all that beautiful stuff. But he always told me that with judo, you don't use your own strength necessarily. You use the strength of your opposing enemy, basically, not the enemy, but your, you know, your competitor, competitor, and then you use their own strength to go back against them. And that's what Jesus often does, you know, with, with the enemy. He uses the enemy's strength. He uses the enemy's tactic. He uses the enemy's pull. He uses the enemy and then places it right back on him using his own strength that he used to try to take you out. Judo Jesus is in effect. But this is the thing about the rescue mission that God's going to use of the curveball. And, and, and to just to avoid like, you know, sappy sayings, I I'm not going to avoid it because I still think it's re it bears repeating. We go from bitter to better. We go from worrier to warrior. We go to we go from mess to message. We go from having a test right to now having a testimony because of this curveball and not in spite of this curveball. We go from like literally feeling like just broken pieces because of this curveball to then being his masterpiece. We go from immobility, like feeling just stunted in my growth to humility. Second Timothy 4.18 says this, the Lord will deliver and rescue you, rescue me from every evil attack. If you've got second Timothy open 4.18, I mean, underline, highlight, circle everything you can when it says to every evil attack. And he will bring me safe, safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. The Lord will deliver and rescue me from every, not some, every evil attack. Judo Jesus will always come in and rescue you from every evil attack when you ask for the rescue. Romans 8, 28. But we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. This is the thing. He's going to work everything out. But sometimes we forget and we miss purposely or unpurposefully to, for those who love him. Do you see another reason why the enemy is keeping you from receiving the love of God? Because if you don't receive the love of God, you will not be able to see God work all things out together for the good. Because for those who love him, we cannot love God until he first loves us. Also, just, just to encourage your hearts right now too, God is using this curveball in your life to deepen you, to establish you, to humble you, to strengthen you, 
to anchor you and to root your faith deeper in because God's already prepared your path. Now he's just preparing you. I've had that I've had that quote on my heart and in my mind over and over to the point where I actually have it as my screensaver right now. God's already prepared your path, but now he's got to prepare you. And this pruning and this shaking and this particular season you're in right now, it is not going to break you. It is intended to make you. It has not been given permission to break you. It has only been given permission to make you. But before it can make us, before it can be used for our good, we first have to receive the love of God. We first have to receive the hope of God. We first have to have the guilt removed because the, the brothers of this story were not able to receive the grace of God because of the guilt that was still on them. I'll start to end it here. I've said this before, but those animal rescue videos, do they just get you? My daughter used to watch those animal rescue videos over and over again. And like those poor seals are like screaming as they're trying to be rescued. And the hands that are are around them, they, they think that it's like causing the current crisis in their life, but the hands that are on them that they think is causing a crisis in their life, causing the curveball in their life are actually the hands that are trying to rescue them from this particular situation. And sometimes God's rescue doesn't look like a rescue, a curveball. It doesn't look like a rescue. That crisis, it doesn't look like a rescue. This shaking doesn't look like a rescue. This, this, dis, this disorientation doesn't look like a reorientation rescue. In fact, the church itself, it grew when it was persecuted. Do you remember the time that Stephen was stoned in the book of Acts? He was stoned for loving Jesus. He was stoned for receiving the love of God. And it was because of this stoning that the church scattered. They, they had to leave this particular place where they all gathered and they went to city to city, to nation to nation. And the word of God just spread because of the curveball, because of the hardship, because of the persecution. God's word scattered. But there's this thing, there was an ultimate curveball, and it was the cross. I want to share this with you, Hebrews 2.9. Because he suffered death for us, Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor. And in Hebrews, it goes on to say in Hebrews 2.9, only by dying could Jesus break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set you free. All who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. It goes on to say in Hebrews 2.18, this curveball, it offered a sacrifice that would take away the sin of the people. Oh, yeah, the enemy thought he threw a curveball at Jesus. And for, for three days, he thought he won. But he didn't realize that on the third day, there was a resurrection that was coming because of the enemy's curveball. It is the same for your life. And sometimes the curveballs of life, the silver coin in your sack, it ends up being God's grace in disguise. I'm going to end it here. I have a, a flight to get to, so I have to end it on time today. Uh, but I want to encourage you, as the Lord has been doing with me, if you're in a curveball season, I would love for you to change the perspective of your heart and to recognize that God is using that curveball the season of your life right now. And it is to shake out the things that are needing to be shaked out and to be pruned in a way that will develop more fruit in your life, not only for your life, but for everyone who does life with you. Curveball seasons are hard. Curveball se seasons are disorienting. Curveball Seasons feel very unstable. But we have two opportunities in a curveball season to run from God or run to God. And when you use a curveball season to run to God, it builds intimacy. And God, over all 
all of this, over all the situations, over all the circumstances, over all the heartaches, over all the grief, over, over all the pain, over all the things that he has allowed to come into your life through the hand of his. It is for one reason and one reason only, and it is to build intimacy between you and him. That's what he desires. That's what he wants. That's what he craves the most is intimacy with his children. And so we fight back the right way. We use the ta- we use the the spiritual weapons to fight the enemy by running to the Father, which builds intimacy because of the curveballs of life. Okay, I'm going to end this. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hop myself on a plane and get back home to y'all. So, Father, I just thank you so much for your presence. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here in this place. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you radically touch every single person listening right now, Father. That there is a true transformation that is happening, a transference from the darkness to the light today, not even because of human words, but because of your spirit, Father. And so, Father, I pray that you would just sweep over every single person in this community, every person listening now and later in a way that they're never touched the same. They are radically changed because of the very tender hand of you, Father, upon their heart. Father, I thank you that you are pouring the oil of joy upon our heads. Father, I pray that you are igniting the ingredient of hope in our weary bones today. I thank you, Father, for that gift of hope that is an anchor to our soul that leads us through the curtain into your presence where Jesus is waiting in the sanctuary. And wherever Jesus is, I want to be. And Jesus is always standing right in front of the throne of grace, ready and able and willing and anxious to cover us with grace that we do not deserve. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, remove the guilt that does not allow us to see the silver coin of grace. Give us a pure heart because the pure will see your face. And the pure see all things as pure. Thank you for your purification right now in the name of Jesus. I receive it. We receive it. And wherever you're at right now listening to my voice and his words, I pray these are his words, Jesus. Will you just say, I receive it. I receive this love that we spoke about today. I receive this hope that only comes from you today. I will allow you to shift and sift and shake and prune, even though this feels so out of control, even though this feels so uncertain, even though this feels so unstable, I will let you do it because Only you are my sure foundation. When everything else is shifting sand, I stand on solid rock. Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being our rescuer from every evil attack. Every evil attack. Thank you, Father God, that we can see you with the eyes of our heart. And when we see you with the eyes of our heart, we see into the spiritual realm. And your army far outweighs the enemies. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' holy and perfect and mighty good name. Amen. Amen. All right, my loves, thanks for joining me today. We'll be back here tomorrow morning, still in these verses. I love you. I pray that this blessed you and encouraged you. Um, I know it, I know it did, it did mine. I really, I really needed this today as well. I love each one of you. We'll see you back here in the morning.